Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of In Conversation With. Today, I'm joined by Professor Kim Schilkamp and Professor Chris Brown. Professor Kim Schilkamp is a professor in data-informed decision-making for learning and development in the Faculty of Behavioural Management and Social Sciences of the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on professional development in data-informed decision-making, and she is the past president of ICSI, the International Congress on School Effectiveness and Improvement. She is also the global editor of the Journal of Professional Capital and Community. Kim's work has influenced practice context in the Netherlands, Sweden, Belgium, and the USA. We are also joined by Professor Chris Brown, who is Professor in Education at the University of Warwick's Department for Education Studies. Chris is seeking to drive forward the notion of professional learning networks, PLNs, as a means to promote the collaborative learning of teachers. The aim of this collaborative learning is to improve both teaching practice and student outcomes, not only in individual schools, but also in the school system more widely. Alongside his research into PLNs, Chris has also a longstanding interest in how research evidence can and should, but often doesn't aid the development of educational policy and practice. Kim and Chris, you're both very welcome. So now it's uh, it's over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, so yeah, we're here to talk about uh, how we can integrate data-informed decision-making with research-informed teaching. And a couple of years ago, Chris and I were talking about this topic, and I do a lot of work in the field of data use, and Chris uh, does a lot of work in the field of research-informed teaching. And then we discovered that basically these are two separate fields, whereas they we think that they really should be combined and they should be integrated. Because in a process of school improvement, you need both data as well as research. So what we did here and what we'd like to talk about is we we thought about how we can integrate these both uh, fields. And we have some ideas that we want to share with you. Uh, and by the way, these ideas are already published. So if you want to get more details, uh, I encourage you to read the paper. So um, when you look at the context uh, that also uh, um, influence this idea uh, is that we see that increasingly instead of top down a lot of uh, national and district governments push for bottom up approaches to school improvement and you also see that in schools more and more uh, people work together in professional learning communities and professional learning networks and these professional learning networks or communities they focus on data use they focus on research use and we saw them as really two separate fields of PLC of PLN activity. But we also saw in our work that you need to combine data and research if you really want to focus on how to improve education. So that led to this specific paper that we're talking about today. Um, so really what this is, and this is also this presentation, and we've been working on this uh, for a few years now, but there's still a lot of work to do, is how we can really combine and integrate uh, data-informed decision-making as well as research-informed practice uh, in professional learning networks to enhance teaching quality, but also in the end, uh, improve student learning and achievement. So what we're gonna to do today is talk about the history and theories of actions of both approaches, their aims and goals, evidence of effectiveness, and then we are going to suggest how we can uh, connect and integrate both approaches. So let's start with data-informed decision-making. Data-informed decision-making is about the collection, analysis, and use of qualitative and quantitative data for decision-making. And uh, I want to stress here that a lot of people associate the data use field with the use of assessment data, but it's really important in the process of data informed decision making that all kinds of data uh, are used. So not only assessment data, achievement data, but for example, uh, student surveys, parent surveys, classroom observations, interviews with students, uh, all kinds of student voice data and so on. What is interesting um, in the field is when I started in this field, um, I would like to say a few years ago, but I think I need to say many years ago, uh, we used the term data-driven decision-making. Uh, but after a couple of years, we realized that in education, 
um, decisions can never be completely driven by data because the data will never tell you exactly what to do. So the field has moved from data driven to data informed decision making, um, which I uh, am in favor of. Well, if you look at the theory of action, um, then you see there are a lot of data use models, but they all use similar steps. First, there is a certain purpose. You collect data for a purpose. You have a question, you have a goal, uh, you collect data. You need to analyze the data, turn it into information, connect that with the already existing knowledge that people have, and then you can turn it into action that hopefully leads to the desired outcomes. It sounds very simple, but in reality, it's not. Uh, so a lot of the work that we do uh, is with the work in data teams where we try to support teachers and school leaders in the use of data. Uh, we developed an eight step procedure, uh, which we take school leaders and teachers in the professional learning network through these steps, step by step. So we focus on uh, first, what is the problem? So we don't start with data but we have a conversation with teachers. What is the problem that you're facing in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, for example, uh, we have a problem with uh, English achievement or mathematics achievement, or during COVID, uh, the well-being of our students. So we identify a problem, uh, we formulate a goal, and then we think about possible causes of that problem in terms of formulating hypotheses. Then we collect data in step three, Unfortunately, there's also a lot of data available in schools that is of low quality. So the data quality check is very important here. A famous saying is garbage in, garbage out. Uh, so it is important to check those data. Then in step five, we analyze the data. And then in step six, six we can come to a conclusion. Hopefully we found uh, causes of our problem which we implement in step seven and evaluate in step eight. Now, what I like about these steps is that we're trying to connect data to the already existing knowledge and experience of teachers and school leaders. So based on the data, we identify a problem, but we have conversations with uh, teachers and school leaders, what they think based on their knowledge of their population, uh, based on their experience, what possible causes are. And the same goes for step seven. If you come to the improvement actions, well, the data can give you some information, but again, you need the knowledge uh, of the teachers and the school leaders to come up with an action plan. And you also need research. It's one of the things that we also discovered, but Chris will talk about that uh, in a few minutes from now. Uh, when you look at the aims and goals of data use, uh, you can see that we can distinguish between a couple of goals. Uh, the first is data use for accountability. Um, sometimes it has a negative connotation, but it is important because parents need to be informed, for example, how their students are doing in the school. Um, so it's an important uh, purpose for data use as well. But the most important purposes are data use for school development and data use for instruction. So how can we use data um, to improve policies in the schools, to work on professional development, but most importantly, how can we improve, use data to improve education, for example, by adapting instruction in the classroom based on data. And the ultimate goal is, of course, improving student achievement. But I would also like to add here, and it's not on the slide, uh, an important goal could also be uh, improving well-being of students are all kinds of other goals that schools may have. Kim, could I just um, just say something just on that, that slide? I mean, one of the papers that you wrote with um, Amanda uh, Datnow, I think was quite interesting in relation to this because um, there's, a, there's a kind of design academic called uh, Norman uh, who kind of talks about this uh, this inability to be creative when you are kind of faced in this situation of fear and I think one of the papers you wrote either two years ago or, or maybe three years ago um, talked about that kind of negative reaction of, of teachers to um, data use when it's kind of in a situation of, of, of kind of accountability and the need to attend to to the emotional state of teachers to make sure that they feel that it's something 
that's welcome to them. And I thought that was a really important paper that you produced. So I just thought it was useful just to introduce that into the into this slide. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I agree. It's something that we found, uh, and not only Amanda, that now and myself, but I think many authors, when there's too much accountability pressure that leads to uh, negative side effects like uh, the anxiety, Chris, that you just mentioned. Um, however, what is interesting as well is that accountability can also be a starting point for a data use process. Um, for example, in the Netherlands, we have school inspections. And often that is a starting point because then schools discover that their final examination results are below the national average. Um, and that's a starting point. Uh, but just a starting point, uh, because then you need to think about, OK, we are uh, below the national average, but where do we want to be? What is our goal and why are we below the national average? And this is when the data use process starts. Um, mm -hmm. We've done a lot of work in looking into how schools are actually using data. And again and again, a lot of studies show that it's not easy. Um, schools struggle with the use of data. Um, there are so many data out there and it's increasing on a daily basis, also as a result of COVID with all the online systems that generate even more data. What you also see uh, in schools, uh, and I think it's human nature, there's a problem and we immediately um, take action to solve that problem. So what we see in schools is, oh, we um, are below the national average on mathematics achievements. Let, let's buy expensive new curriculum materials or let's increase the number of hours that we spend on teaching mathematics. However, if you do, know, do not know what the causes of your problem are, it's not very likely that these kinds of actions will solve the problem. Because if the causes have to do with the instruction in the classroom, then buying new materials or increasing the number of hours will not fix your problem. What we also see is that using data is a complex process. Uh, you require data literacy. Now, unfortunately, although it is changing, most teacher education programs do not spend a lot of time on data literacy. So what we see is that we really need to invest in both teacher education as well as professional development. And I already said it before, but I think it's really important that we do not forget the human touch here and that we need to look for ways to combine data with the expertise of teachers and educators. Well, the good news is uh, there are studies looking into the effects of data use. And although it's not easy, but when provided with support, uh, we see that data use can really contribute to school improvement in terms of increased student learning and increased student achievements. And you see a couple of examples here on the screen. And one of the conclusions uh, of some of our studies is also that uh, in the school improvement process, teachers and educators need data, they need their own knowledge and experience, but they also need research. So over to Chris. Thank you. Nicely done. So um, it, with regards to kind of research informed teaching practice, um, you know, in, increasingly now there's a, an impetus for wanting to get teachers to use research uh, and engage with research activity to improve what they do. So going through a process of um, locating research, of engaging with research, of verifying the quality as you do with the data and applying it to practice. But this isn't a new thing in, in many senses. I mean, if we we kind of go back 2000 years to, to looking at Plato and, and Plato's notion of the re Republic, I mean, what's key to that, um, that kind of state, city state, is that actually um, academics, rulers, everybody else is kind of looking at the kind of best available knowledge and using that knowledge. And likewise, you know, if we, if we kind of go forward a, a 1500 years, we have people like Francis Bacon writing about, you know, kind of a, the utopian society and what that might look like. Um, and having in place a, a kind of scientific institution that's continually in exploring and investigating, um, you know, what seems to be effective and using that to the kind of benefit of, of, of humanity. So this notion of kind of engaging with knowledge to improve one's situation isn't 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 new. But in terms of education, I guess um, increasingly we are hoping that that teachers will engage with research evidence um, to take on board what is known, what is out there, 
and to use it alongside what teachers know in order to to improve what they do. So really, this idea of, of kind of research informed teaching practice is, is saying, OK, well, how do we formalize that? How do we kind of make that proper so that actually it it can work in a, in a meaningful way within schools so if we move to the next slide please kim so we like kim was saying in terms of you know a, a definition early stage kind of research informed teaching practice was also about this idea of research based teaching or research based practice this idea that i think still held by many people that if you develop an understanding of what works if you develop an understanding of what's effective if you can find programs that have shown uh, to improve children's outcomes that you can get teachers to implement those with fidelity uh, and will, if you do that exactly right and attend to all the kind of contextual factors that influence that you'll have kind of guaranteed improved outcomes but we know you know from many studies um, studies of England for example where we've we've um, kind of looked exactly at how teachers engage with research but also the work of, of Carol Weiss and others that there are many ways that practitioners or policymakers or others engage with research you know sometimes those ways are instrumental ways so you can actually follow what research says and you can actually implement something in practice but other ways are more conceptual so research tends to serve to act as a as a kind of lamppost not a signpost it illuminates the possibilities it kind of enables people to um, alter their thinking and their understanding of a particular problem so it comes into play and, and helps um shine a light on the kind of possibilities that are out there and so for that reason we kind of prefer terms like this produced by england's department for education which talk about this notion of a combination and they talk about this idea of research informed teaching practice as a, a combination of, of what teachers know and what, what's out there and i think that's that's really important because if we think about a classroom if we think about you know if a big secondary school you know we have 30 teachers maybe and if those teachers have been there, you know, 10, 15 years or have been practitioners for 10, 15 years, you know, we're talking about 300, 400 years of experience. So before we kind of go out and say, well, what do academics know about how to improve teaching and learning? We kind of think, well, what do, what do teachers themselves know? What expertise sits situated within that room? How can we make that often tacit or unspoken knowledge explicit? How can we understand people's perceptions of a particular problem or what that looks like and then how can we see how that research might come in and augment or challenge or deepen those those problems and, and take them further so increasingly then that's that's what we are are looking at and um in in in, in that sense taking that forward and taking that um that notion of of, of research informed practice forward what um what that then gives us is a kind of theory of action that that basically says well if we are um if we are designing um a new intervention um that research can be used to enhance our ability to make that intervention work um and therefore as a result student outcomes should improve but i think it's important you know to have a theory of action of that theory of action and, and in many ways what we need teachers to do is to engage with um, that research in such a way that they are developing an approach to teaching and learning that um, they have understanding or a cause for why it should work so there's a kind of you know a cause and effect in their minds for well if we do this particular intervention if we take on board this particular program what should that look like then they're thinking about things like activities and interactions so what if that's going to work you know what might we be expecting teachers to do who might be expecting them to engage with as a result of that what changes to their understanding might we expect what changes to their behaviors might might we expect and then what changes to student outcomes might we expect and i think that that kind of approach can be used across you know a variety of different things we might have kind of very tactical needs that we need to address as teachers so we may be you know have a class in front of us and we have problems with that class not problems but issues that we want to address so there may be a kind of very tactical issue for wanting to engage in this kind of research informed practice or we may have more strategic issues that, that stretch across the school you know the nature of the school composition or you know the the ability to sorry or the need to introduce a new kind of government initiative might require us to act in a particular way or we might want to um 
kind of, uh, you, you know, seek our, our or cast our net out to see what programs we might want to implement to continually improve what we do. Or, you know, we may just want to enhance our thinking and understanding about a particular issue. So that kind of notion of um, the theory of action, you, you know, within itself has to have the theory of action, I think, for how this is supposed to supposed to work. Uh, next slide, please, Kim. Generally speaking, you know, we have these imperatives for why we might want to engage in this. Um, and as Kim's kind of mentioned in relation to data use, um, you know, there are a variety of starting points for what we might want to do. And I think uh, those are those are similar for research use, but I think there are other imperatives that certainly I've, I've been looking at in this in this area. So um you know we have a moral imperative and in these don't these don't these aren't exclusive to research use they, they cover kind of data use as well um but there's a moral imperative you know you have people like Anne oakley saying that um anybody who's going to intervene in the lives of others needs to be doing it so that has the most benefit and the least harm you know this is something adrian ultimately calls that the first do no harm principle so we want to be making sure that practitioners not just teachers but everybody who works in the public sphere uh is is kind of armed with the best available evidence that can help them engage um, in the most effective way possible. So we do have that that kind of moral imperative, and we also have a social imperative as well. I think um, for engaging in research use. So you know, there's a there's a question of of teacher professionalism. There's a question of of you know what what standing a teacher's in and. If, if they're in the same standing as, as people that we'd like them to be, like doctors and lawyers and so on, that kind of notion of, of keeping oneself up to date with the most of, uh, available uh, understanding of the world is absolutely important. So, you know, you would expect people to be engaging with the latest um, kind of research evidence to see why something should be done. Um, and then you also have the uh, kind of impact imperative. Um, and to begin with you know we have this understanding that um if we can kind of get this right then actually it can make a massive difference you know as ben goldacre suggests there's a huge prize uh, waiting to be claimed by teachers and if we can establish a culture in which you know research evidence is used as a matter of course we can improve outcomes for uh, children and professional um learning and also increase ind uh, independence uh, yeah, next slide, please. Thank you. And um, whilst that is true, and whilst we, um, you know, do have evidence of, of effectiveness, which I'll talk about in a second, the bit that's missing for us, I think, is how do you do it effectively? So um, we have, you know, different trials. We have uh, organisations like the Education Endowment Foundation that that have looked at um, different ways of implementing evidence use. Myself, I've been working on research learning networks which try and engage in a process of uh, of that kind of cycle of inquiry in a, a networked um, group of people from across schools where we're trying to get them to think about um, you know what's the problem trying to address what's the current situation um, how might we develop an intervention using that theory of action approach put it in place with colleagues in a collaborative way and, and see um, what difference that makes so you know there are kind of different approaches that are underway i know also colleagues such as jonathan sharples and um mike coldwell have been looking at the kind of systems aspect you know and thinking about the kind of systems implications for this but we still are yet to really crack um crack this as a kind of okay we definitely have a way that we know definitely makes a difference if we engage with with research use uh thank you now um, we do have some evidence of effectiveness, as I've said. You know, we have um, those on the slide here. So people like John Sopovitz talking about, um, you know, we can see that across school systems, are, are, when they are highly performing, a, a kind of common characteristic is that engagement with research. And we do have that kind of correlation evidence where research is used as part of high quality professional development, as high quality uh, initial teacher training. That things do happen. More recently, we've got the work, I think, you know, Joe Rose and colleagues who did a randomized control trial um, of, of research use and, and found some evidence to suggest that actually when teachers engage um, in a research informed way, there is a, a kind of correlation to primary school outcomes. Um, we have the work of David Godfrey, who's um, kind of looked not only 
at effects but also benefits um so suggesting that there are kind of external externalities or additional benefits that that exist into this way of working but we still need to move further here i think joe rose's work is probably the most promising in in terms of you know actually taking 110 schools uh 55 be given a treatment on how to engage in research use and 55 not and as well as that kind of you know that ideal gold standard um impact on student outcomes you know there was also very kind of positive relationships that they found between that and, and teachers practice okay next slide please thank you so we've talked about you know, data use, and we've talked about research use. And as Kim said at the beginning, these things in many ways existed in, in two, as two separate fields for a very long time. And um, and yet each kind of really has deficiencies and benefits that complement uh, the others nicely. If we look at the next slide, we have, you know, uh, there are, if we have research informed teaching practice on the right hand side and, and data informed decision making on the left, um, you, know, you know, we have, pros and cons of each that 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 really really work well together so um with with um data informed decision making you know there's there's a clear need in terms of the vision and goals of a school you have a very specific problem that's perhaps emerged from the data and that you want to tackle um whereas with research and from teaching uh, sorry uh, yeah teaching practice that's not necessarily the, the the case um you aren't necessarily doing that on the basis of of something you've identified you might be but you don't have to be um whereas um you know if we um look at you know the, the kind of solutions to that problem or the ways of, of implementing that problem um with data informed decision making you know often there's a reliance on once you've found the problem locating that solution from within the school or if you're working in a kind of learning network professional learning network across colleagues in the school which is absolutely fine because as i said you know when when you've got a situation of, of um you know 30 teachers with 10 years experience there's going to be a lot of understanding there but the benefits of engaging with research is that you then get a whole variety of other perspectives and understandings that you can draw in things that maybe you hadn't thought about things that maybe kind of present new ideas um or emerging ideas that just haven't reached you yet um and often you know there's evidence of the effectiveness of those ideas now officially have them and so on but this kind of notion that actually there has been some practice elsewhere that's worked is quite handy i think um that also then ties into the, the next point you know you need to develop a context specific solution you can't necessarily just import something from the from the research um but you know that that implementation again you might be able to find a, a solution from from the research base so there's this kind of pros and those cons that, that exist and we were thinking okay well this is nice then so what would that look like if we brought it together and actually we've got a, a, a um i have to quickly count each stage uh process for how that might look so um actually i didn't need to count because it says eight stage on the on the left hand side um so you start off with this process of vision and goal setting right so what is it we're trying to achieve you know what has data in, uh identified or what is there a particular policy goal that has put in place and need to do something um and from there you know what are the potential causes of that problem what does the data say that might be driving that particular issue and can we collect data about that course? And then can we check the quality of that data? And can we draw conclusions from that? And once we've had, we've kind of made that diagnostic, and once we've engaged in that process of diagnosing that, so as, as Kim was saying at the beginning, you know, kind of collecting that data, making sure and validating the quality of that data, putting in place hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, and so on. And once we're very firm in the problem that we've um, identified and put together, can we then also, as well as kind of looking at the expertise within the room, can we also then cast our net more widely, engage with research evidence, see what other people have done, see what evidence suggests, see what might be effective? And can we do that in a process of a learning conversation that helps us develop a new approach to um, teaching and learning or, or whatever the specific aspect of the problem is? Putting in place a very detailed action plan that relies on that theory of action. But again, drawing on the the data part to know what we need to collect to assess whether it's been impactful or not and making sure that data is attended to assessing our impact and seeing at the end how that's 
kind of it helps us reevaluate that problem where we currently are, whether we need to readjust what we've been doing, whether we are happy with the solution we've got and can now park it, or whether we have to, um, uh, you know, set a new vision and go around that, that cycle again. So broadly, that's that's kind of where we're at. That's what we, we, we've been doing, you know, trying to think of ways of bringing these things together and think of uh, ways to take this, this forward. So hopefully that was useful for you, Gavin. Thanks so much to, to both of you for such a thorough overview of these two worlds that, you know, are very complementary. But it seems to me, obviously, that part of your argument is that this, while they're complementary, combining them and blending them is difficult. I wonder if one of the reasons for that is because over time, different maybe um, governments that are in power place priority on different ones and that that kind of leaves a bit of a scattered legacy maybe for professionals. Yeah, I I think that is the case. But I also think that uh, emphasizing data use or research use uh, is a wrong starting point. I remember many years ago, uh, I had a conversation uh, with people from the Dutch government and we were talking about data use and it was almost like data use was the new goal. Like in all of the policy documents, it said schools need to use data. And then I asked, but use data for what? I mean, data use, the same as research use, is a tool. So instead of focusing on uh, policies on data use or policies on research use, I think uh, the focus should be on school improvement and how we can help uh, the students in our schools. And then data and evidence are tools in that process of school improvement. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I also, I also think of one of uh, another issues is often more practical in that these are kind of we've almost emerged as two different communities and and in many ways it's a kind of cultural thing of, of bringing people together and, and getting people to work together i mean it, it um i mean geographically physically geographically uh you know kim's based in the netherlands there are not many people in england that i know that are working in 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 data use um so it's it's kind of and if we think about the states, you know, you have some certain people. I mean, I know, you know, Liz Parley Ripple, for example, is, is kind of majoring on research use, but has seen the, the kind of benefit of this. But other people are, are based in different places and focusing on data use. So we kind of, you know, we need to, um, I think, bring, physically bring people together and, and work on problems and get a community going in that then kind of you know applies for funding or, or sets in place at an intervention or something something like that so it's it's not not that there isn't willingness but i think it's actually you know there there isn't much prox uh proximity um and trying to overcome that i think also also is important maybe this is time to give a quick plug chris to the world educational research association uh yeah, absolutely. So we we do have a um, international research network of, of which obviously you and, and Kim are both part. And the idea there was to think about uh, how we um, kind of support um, you know evidence use more uh, more effectively. And, and we've kind of got um, colleagues. I think there's there's twenty or thirty colleagues as part of that from across five continents. It's very comprehensive. So yeah, the, the aim of that is to try and, and, and build understanding in this area. So thank you for that, Gavin. Uh, one of the other things I suppose that I've observed in, in my own research is the convergence of educational leadership and evaluation across global contexts. Is that, obviously it's an opportunity for this kind of approach to uh, school improvement, but is it also kind of a challenge if we go too far on just associating research and uh, informed practice, data informed decision making with the purposes of evaluation? Just wonder what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I totally agree. Um, what's what's I think quite interesting. I mean, the leadership aspect. I think this this whole process relies on leadership in many ways. You know, you have to have formal leaders. Uh, at a school, uh, attending to this, agreeing with it, making it a priority, making it one of the the main core features of the school, uh, committing resources to it, uh, making it part of the the kind of way things are done around here. So I think it doesn't work unless you have that. But I also think as well, given that there's a kind of move to working in networks, school leaders also have to be able to be willing to see power to distribute to leadership to um, having a system in which they're happy for people to go from their school into network develop new approaches to teaching and learning come back and embed those so i do think the leadership aspect absolutely needs to be attended to uh, 
Um, but I think, yes, the, the evaluation thing is a problem. I mean, it depends on context, obviously. We we certainly have, we, we did a, an edited book recently where we, we brought together people from um, a number of different um, countries and look, got them to look at, you know, the, the state of, of research evidence informed practice in relation to the kind of accountability uh, and social regulation in that country. And what was fascinating was that in, you know, different things materialize in different ways but actually you know that sometimes that accountability acts as a driver in a in a positive way because when it's not there in, in certain countries where there isn't kind of you know school inspection it's about moral imperative and that's it and that doesn't always help facilitate you know school improvement in a, a sorry a research use in a in a meaningful way um but at the same time you know work we've done on looking at people that drive change in schools there, there isn't much scope given to bottom up school improvement often. And I think that that's a bit that's missing, you know, getting people to identify those kind of things they'd really love to improve or, or that relate to the kind of the community that their school is situated in that they could, you know, help attend to and, and do that through this, this kind of process of, of kind of data and research use. And I think that that bit is missing, you know, helping people become more agentic, um, and, and more willing to, to embed change and supporting that process. Kim, just one question I had for you. You mentioned initial teacher education and data literacy. I think this is a fascinating area. What kinds of emerging pieces of research are in that space? And what kinds of imperatives do we have as you know academics who work in, in that space, broadly speaking? Uh, a colleague from the US, Ellen Mandenek, um, did a study a couple of years ago where she looked at uh, teacher training and to what extent uh, time was spent uh, on data literacy. Uh, I had a PhD student uh, repeating her study for the Netherlands uh, a couple of years later, but both studies show um, that the amount of time that uh, is spent in teacher training on data literacy is not a lot, although of course there are differences between organizations. Um, it's not always integrated, like sometimes it's taught as a separate thing like data literacy and sometimes it's integrated with uh, other courses, uh, which I think would be better because again, uh, data use is a tool uh, and not a goal. Um, but then again, I work at a teacher ed education program. I also understand uh, the time that we have with our students is very limited. Uh, and we need to train them in classroom management and uh, instruction and all these other topics. Um, so there's just also a lack of time in teacher training. Although if we integrate it with some of the existing courses, we can uh, lay a foundation. Like I do think that in teacher education, we need to lay the foundation. But at my university, for example, we came to the realization that that's not enough. So we offer professional development uh, after teacher training uh, so that uh, we can support schools in really uh, working on data literacy um, uh, after the program as well. In terms of research literacy, we only have one course and that's at the end uh, where our students have to do a research project in their school and also collect data and use some research. But again, it's so limited. Uh, and also in that area, I think we lay a foundation, but that needs to develop further. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we're talking about, off, you know, one year courses often and, and for, for teacher training, and it's just simply not, not enough time to do everything we want, we want to do with it. I mean, we want teachers to be able to hit the ground running in terms of being able to teach. Um, but we also want so many other things from them as well. And I think either we really radically rethink the process of, of teacher training and you know how long it should be and so on or we as kim said have to put in place that structured professional development that's kind of expected as opposed to optional um in terms of moving forward and i mean i think you know i, I would agree in terms of that, that literacy i mean obviously we would hope that the graduates would be would be research literate in in the sense of they've, they've done a degree and they, they hope to be able to engage with research but i think um that's not necessarily the case and they may not always understand what that literacy entails so you know i, I think it's it's imperative to be able to do these these kind of postgraduate um professional development courses and keep them going i mean people don't you know 
the, the, w- w- people need to refresh you know school leaders need to understand what's required of them to support this kind of stuff so yeah well and it ties in with all the policies i think across the world on uh, emphasis on lifelong learning and first what you also said uh, about keeping up to date with research but i think the 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 challenge here is, and I think we are already um, finding out ways to do it, is tie it in with existing work. Mm. So not like in the beginning, we sometimes thought, okay, then we have to um, get teachers that have followed our program back to the university and do a university course on data use. Uh, I don't think that that really works, but tying it in with the things that they're working on, uh, for example, if they have a problem with well-being of their students or mathematics or safety or whatever topic, and then um, making use of the fact that more and more people are working together in professional learning networks and then finding that combination, okay, you want to work in a professional learning network, uh, you want to solve a specific problem. Now let's support you in the use of data and research during that process to make that process more effective because uh, a colleague of ours, Cindy Portman, also has done a lot of work in the field of professional learning networks and Chris works with her uh, mm. a lot. But she found in previous studies that professional learning networks are not always that effective and are, do not always use data and research. And if we can support the existing networks that are there uh, and helping them leveraging uh, the power of data and research, uh, then hopefully it doesn't feel like extra work or uh, an increase of work pressure, but it helps people in what they're already doing. Yeah. I mean, what I'm hearing here kind of loud and clear is that the capacity to engage with data and research is, you're you're arguing, and, and I would agree, if so, a central tenet of contemporary teacher professionalism, yeah. uh, much like maybe collaborative professionalism we now accept, and possibly there's a link between the two, because it strikes me loud and clear that, you know, when you are research engaged, data informed decision making, it leads to collaboration within and beyond your school, which is building on, on Cindy Portman's work and Chris, your work as well, this research learning network idea, I guess. Yeah, I think the collaboration uh, when it comes to data use and research use is essential because an important part of using research and data is sense making. Mm-hmm. And uh, I always say to my students, well, for example, on a scale from one to 10, where six is a sufficient, uh, one student may be very happy with a six on average, but another student might not be happy with that same number six. So different, uh, the same data have different meanings for different people. And the same goes for research evidence. It's about interpretation. And if you do that interpretation individually, you might come up with completely different conclusions when uh, you do that collaboratively. Mm. And I think in schools where educators are collaboratively responsible for the learning and well-being of their students, uh, you just need to do this together. And of course, there are examples when individual students quickly look at the results of their classroom. I'm not saying that you have to do everything together, but when it comes to uh, really important goals or problems that you want to solve, then that collaboration uh, is crucial. Mm -hmm. Final question, where to next for the worlds of uh, that informed decision-making and research-informed teaching in their their quest for for further combination? Well, I I mean, you're you're doing work on... uh big data and AI, I guess. Do you want to kick off with that? Yeah, I have two um, avenues for further research. Well, well, first is I want to keep on supporting schools in the use of data and research and professional learning networks, uh, such as data teams. Um, It's something that we uh, keep on doing and studying. Um, One thing I became interested in is we've been focusing on uh, teachers and school leaders uh, as data users, but I have a couple of projects running now on students as data users uh, because our students also have to deal with all the data that is currently available in our society. And they need to leverage uh, those data for their own learning, but also uh, to be a full citizen in our society. Um, So I think that is something that we need to dig in deeper. And the other thing that I'm really interested in is how techniques such as AI, uh, artificial intelligence, can help uh, the process of data use in schools like um, 
Uh, now, a lot of the data use work is manually getting data out of the system, uh, doing the analysis in Excel, for example. And I think AI and certain algorithms should be able to make that whole process easier. And I have to say, I've been doing this work before the launch of GPT, because I think now a lot of people are interested in AI because of uh, that new system. But we've been looking into ways how we can leverage all of the possible benefits that AI has uh, to support the data use process in schools. Also being aware of all the potential dangers that <laughs> it has, of course. I think, I think for myself, there are two, two things I'm looking at. I mean, one um, it kind of alludes to what Kim was saying when she was talking about students. I'm interested more generally in this kind of world of, of, of kind of post-truths and alternative facts and everything else, how we kind of go beyond um, go beyond the school to understand how we can get people more generally to engage in evidence in a meaningful way so that they are engaging critically, that they are triangulating, that they are making sense, that they are kind of challenging. And I think that also links to AI because I think one of the, you know, if we think about the role of education, it's to prepare people for, you know, the 21st century, 22nd century, whatever else it might be. And as we get this kind of growth of different technologies, we need to support people to engage with that effectively. We need to help people become critical users of chat, GTP or whatever it might be, um, or social media or whatever they are doing so that they are, that we are creating people that are knowledge uh, knowledge sufficient, knowledge capable, and they're not just kind of believing everything that, that kind of comes out of Twitter or, or everything they type into chat TTV, but actually they are critical consumers of knowledge and evidence. And I think that's uh, important to have as part of the curriculum within school, but I think it's important to have as part of a, a kind of a, a capacity that exists um, outside of school and just trying to work out how we get people to in critically engage with those uh, with their, those ideas I think is important so and Chris maybe you also want to mention uh, I really like the project that you're doing at the moment where you use uh, data from uh, video games oh yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's another project yeah so um yeah so we've we've also the other thing we've got as well is a, a big EU funded project called mega skills and um basically what we're trying to do there is to understand uh, what soft skills are required for the 21st century um, and the extent to which video games develop those soft skills and whether we can use the kind of data that exists from people playing current video games so not you know bespoke video games um, and use artificial intelligence as part of that to derive an understanding of the new uh, the behaviors they've been engaging in the new skills those things develop and whether we can then use things like blockchain technology uh, to develop kind of micro credentials that those people can then use to present to teachers or employers to say look actually um as well as the kind of the the visual curriculum that you can see i've been engaging with also we've got this kind of uh, less visible curriculum that i i as a result means that i'm good at co collaboration creativity teamwork whatever it might be um so we're also doing that as well interesting data, data, data all around <laughs> Uh, I just want to say thanks again to you both uh, for your presentation this morning, for sharing your reflections and for also giving us some insights into the future of this area. I really appreciate it. And I know that the viewers will as well. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for inviting us, Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having us.